know the whole story. But we only have limited information. And so the future seems uncertain. And uncertainty can lead to suspense. Say you find out your test was positive. Does that make you anxious or excited? Yes, it depends on knowing what it was. You probably ask questions to help you navigate what happens next. Suppose it was the COVID test. We might ask, is that test accurate? Does testing positive always mean that I actually have it? How sick will I get? How long will it last? Could I spread it to someone else? What's the best treatment to recover quickly? Well, maybe data can help us answer some of these questions. But the data we have are often messy or difficult to interpret. And so any answers we get, too, are prone to uncertainty. Now, how about the pregnancy test? Well, will the pregnancy go smoothly? Boy or girl? How long and difficult is labor going to be? Again, data and statistics can give us context to these questions, but how it goes on an individual level is very much uncertain. Now, in fact, the positive pregnancy test was part of our story for my wife and I about eight months ago. So, if you do the math, right, the reason I'm able to be here with you today and not be in a delivery room is because baby is still inside the mom, as I speak. <laughs> um, but that timing isn't something I could have predicted with any certainty, despite being a stats professor. Let's go back a few years. On our very first date, my now wife said to me, I don't like statistics. <laughs> not a great start, right? <laughs> But somehow, uh, a few dates later, here we were, um, in the middle of a little hike through the forest in Waterloo. And I stopped to take this picture, and I said to her, hey, this would be a great illustration for my stats class. The spacing of the trees doesn't look random. It looks like they're systematically spread out, like one of those repelling point process models. So, that last part probably meant as little to her then as it does to you now. So, <laughs> Odds are, maybe not such a smart move on my part. <laughs> uh, but here we are now, so that ended up going better than I expected. So what, what do we mean when we say the spacing of trees isn't random? Well, often when we say random in everyday language, we mean that there's no preference for one outcome versus another. Um, you flip a fair coin. Heads or tails is 50-50. You roll a fair die. Each of the numbers 1 to 6 has a 1 in 6 chance. Or every tree in the plot of land has the same chance to appear anywhere, regardless of other trees. So imagine you are two plots of land, and each circle represents a tree. When you look at this, you, know, you might ask, well, which, which plot is more random, uh, in the sense that every tree has the same chance to appear anywhere in the plot? Turns out, our brains perceive randomness in a particular way. Uh, many people, including some students in my class, would uh, choose plot A to be more random. Right? Things are pretty nicely arranged. Then um, actually, it turns out it's plot B that exhibits the kind of uniform randomness that we were just talking about. And in it, you actually see large empty spaces right, and clumps of trees together. And so, often our brains prefer you know, patterns, structure, predictability, over uncertainty. Maybe even subconsciously. In fact, isn't that what our whole scientific understanding is based off of? That's why we have models, right? Models try to explain or approximate what's happening in the real world. Models are simplified descriptions of reality that we can study. They bring patterns, structure, and predictability into our study of science. Models have inputs and outputs. So you can imagine a model as like a toy box, right, with lots of connections and knobs that you can adjust. And we make those adjustments 
until the outputs are calibrated to imitate what we see in the real world. Right? That's a model. And so models can be fairly simple. Right? They could have just a few knobs, like a model to describe the spacing of trees. Or they could be incredibly complex. Large language models like ChatGPT right, have over a trillion parameters or knobs that can be adjusted in their quest to mimic human language. And so when we talk about models, we tend to think of certainty, explainability. But what if uncertainty is actually helpful? Or in fact, uncertainty is even crucial to embrace. Whether we like it or not, the things we observe and experience in the world are full of uncertainty. Right? And so the question becomes, well, why don't we try to learn from it? Think of it this way. If something happens the same way every time, in an entirely deterministic way, there's often little, little new that we can learn. Say, an object that follows the laws of classical physics, right, for example. But when the things we observe are seemingly random, that can be an opportunity for us to learn. And the research I work on as a professor supports that idea. A lot of statistics and data science is about learning and discovering knowledge from uncertainty. To get to useful models, we have to wade through uncertainty. Thinking about uncertainty in, in this way, right, we can make use of data, and we wade through that messy data and try to make sense of it. So that we can do things like make informed decisions or better understand the science and, and so on. So to illustrate the power of embracing uncertainty in this way, let me take you through a few examples from my own research, where we can understand the science just a bit better with the help of data and uncertainty. Let's call it data science in action, if you will. So embracing uncertainty helps us take what we see and use it to learn about what we can't see. Proteins are the machines of life. They play crucial roles in virtually all biological processes. In our own bodies, they help carry specialized functions um, like blood transport, digestion, eyesight, muscle movements. But other proteins are responsible for disease. So how do we know how a protein works and functions. Turns out that its three-dimensional structure tends to give us a pretty big clue about how it works. And what helps determine a protein's 3D structure? Well, it's the sequence of amino acids coded for by the underlying DNA. So think of amino acids as building blocks for proteins. So like Lego pieces of different types, when you put them together in a specific order, that's how we end up with proteins that have different structures, and it's their structures that enable them to carry out their specific functions. So we have this little diagram. Now, as science has progressed, it's uh, become pretty easy to decode uh, the sequence of amino acids that a gene codes for. But protein structure is trickier. And why is that? Well, it's because proteins are dynamic. In other words, they move. So back when COVID was just starting, there was a lot of interest in the scientific community on this specific spike protein that the virus codes for. And that's because the spike protein changes shape as it gets ready to attack and latch onto human cells and make us sick. But such dynamic movements in proteins they are hard to study. Well, we can go to a lab, and there's techniques we can use to take still 3D images of proteins. But taking movies of proteins in motion is still currently elusive. Maybe someday we can. And you say, well, there's, how about AI, like Google's AlphaFold, right? And yes, AI is pretty powerful for doing some things, like predicting what a unknown protein structure might look like. But AlphaFold can't quantify how proteins move because, as I mentioned, 
the data to train the AI to do that doesn't yet exist. And so the still images of proteins that we have might represent just a small fraction of the structures we might see if we were able to take a movie. And so by recognizing this uncertainty in our data, we can develop new methods and algorithms, build models that imitate the laws of physics and explain what we have seen. And then we can use computers to help us explore the unseen possibilities. And that's one area where my research aims to contribute in just one small way. And by doing so, we can discover additional clues for protein function, especially when they relate to disease. And as a result, that gives a key puzzle piece for scientists to find much needed cures. Embracing uncertainty also helps us make sense of missing information. So let's take proteins a little bit further. Proteins don't usually work in isolation. They interact with other proteins. And the amount of protein presence can depend on the presence or absence of other proteins. So, in other words, they, they can regulate each other. So remember how um, basic molecular biology works? Right? Information goes from DNA to producing messenger RNA and then to producing protein. Furthermore, the amount of protein can depend on the amount of mRNA presence. And all of these amounts can change over time in response to stimuli. So that sounds pretty complicated, right? Indeed it is, and our bodies and living organisms are created quite amazingly like that. Maybe so you have all these interacting components. And so let, let's, we can think of these amounts as components of like a system or a machine and that work together so that the system as a whole is well regulated and operates smoothly. And so biologists and chemists, they would propose models uh, to describe this kind of thing, how, how different components work together. But sometimes we can't see all the components. Maybe some we can't measure accurately, and others we can't. We don't even have the tools to observe them at all. And so that makes models difficult to work with, right? or, or to calibrate, to imitate reality, because they depend on missing information. So in our research, we found that by stacking on this additional layer of uncertainty, like building a model on top of a model, if you will, it turns out that can be key to helping us discover how these missing components behave. And therefore, when one part of the system breaks down, we can know what other parts of the system could be adjusted to help fix it. So uncertainty can be counterintuitive like that. Sometimes to get places, we have to adopt uncertainty as an ally rather than treating it as a foe. Third, embracing uncertainty helps us face the future. Let's come back to the trees and forests. They're the source of a sustainable and renewable material that's widely used for construction. Lumber or wood. In our research, I've also enjoyed working with engineers to better understand the properties of wood. And you say, why is that interesting? Well, turns out wood-based buildings are currently experiencing a resurgence in popularity. In my hometown of Vancouver, BC, this 18-story high hybrid wood building was built in 2017. It was the tallest of its kind in the world at the time. And among various safety considerations with like, really tall wood buildings, engineers have to be careful because the quality of wood varies among pieces. Its strength has uncertainty. I mean, you look at the pieces here, even each piece in this bundle, you can see they, they each look different. The engineer who introduced me to this fascinating field of research once conveyed this concept to me in a, in a more elegant way. He said, wood is not like steel. Each piece of wood has its own personality. So beyond that, wood also tends to weaken over long periods of time, say 50 or more years, as it's subject to the stresses of 
holding up a structure at its occupants. But you say, who can wait 50 years to collect data? That's more than half a lifetime for most people. And so here too, models can help us study the uncertainty and the strength of lumber over time. And so you can create innovative, forward-looking buildings and ensure that they're also safe. And so hopefully with these, these illustrations, I've shown you how uncertainty can play important and sometimes even surprising roles in our journey of scientific discovery. Now, of course, we've got to be careful with models, right? If, and we've got to make sure we don't use models to mislead people, as we could if we use them improperly. Um, we all saw how so many COVID model predictions were just flat out wrong. Or ChatGPT is prone to making things up or hallucinating. So, for one thing, we have to carefully study the science and the data and acknowledge the limitations of models. And for another thing, uh, we should report uncertainty in our model outputs, say, providing a range of plausible outcomes rather than just a single number of statistics. And a lot of statistics is about doing that. But still, don't count on things always turning out in ways that are considered likely. After all, isn't that why each of us is on our own personalized adventure? Like we saw with the trees in the forest, our brains favor certainty. But life is anything other than predictable. And the suspense from real life uncertainty can make us anxious or excited, or maybe both. Right? And the way it works is sometimes the most exciting moments in life, right? Aren't, aren't they the ones that have to come through or after navigating uncertainty? Like for us, waiting to find out if we can see the baby. And for us now, we're waiting to meet her, right? Or if you're in the process of trying to land your dream job. Or Finding out if that romantic interest is mutual, right? There's certainty and excitement here. <laughs> so let's embrace the adventure rather than be fearful of it. Embrace uncertainty so we can learn about what we can't see. Embrace uncertainty so we can make sense of missing information. And embrace uncertainty so we can face the future. We can learn valuable life lessons along the way too, like finding greater joy, peace, and patience, no matter what happens. After all, some of the best opportunities in both science and in life are the ones that we couldn't have planned or predicted to begin with. Thank you.